Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you for that very nice and flowery introduction. I'm not sure that I can live up to all these nice things that you have said about me. It puts a pretty big load on a drunk's shoulders, you know. I generally get accused of talking too loud, and I may not need that, or I may blow a fuse for you, but I hope not. (laughs) We heard a nice prayer from a gentleman of the cloth. I have a little prayer from a drunk that I would like to give at this time. Thank you, God, for this day's sobriety. And thank you for the good things you have given me. And thank you, God, for AA and for the AA program. And help me, God, to share it with others. Amen. First, I have an apology to make. You know, we've been making apologies all our lives, so one more won't hurt. My good friend John McGinnis over here, who I helped raise, maybe that's what's the matter with him. (laughs) Had a birthday yesterday, and I was awful sorry he told me how old he was, because I remember him as an ordinary little brat. And he told me how old he was, and I knew I was a good bit older. And I thought, my God, John, are you getting that old? But it's nice to see you, John. John invited me here a year or two ago to lead this meeting, and I said, John, I'd please, I'd rather not. And then when I got this nice invitation, I didn't realize it was John's meeting. So, like all alcoholics, we're always getting in trouble, you know. I want to say that it's nice to be at the 28th anniversary of any group. I have been to a good many meetings and to a good many groups, and I don't think I've ever had the red carpet treatment that we've received here tonight. We got here a little bit early, and the coffee wasn't made yet, and one of the good brothers said, well, we've got some some, uh, instant coffee. We'll make you a cup right now, and he did. And then some other kind soul put a rose on me, No, that's not a rose, but it's a posy, and I'm not used to having posies put on me. I didn't suppose I'd ever get one of them until they buried me. I know there was a time when there was a lot of people who would have liked to have buried me and then put a dandelion or something on me. (laughs) But by the help of this wonderful program and a person who we, a being that we have come to know as God, I have been able to to stay sober. I don't know how the weather was in Cleveland this morning, but in Coshocton, the sun came up warm and nice and bright. And I thought as I walked over to the office, uh, isn't it wonderful? A fellow that I used to know up here of the name of Howard used to say, isn't it wonderful to be sober? And I thought about that this morning, and I thought, isn't it wonderful to be sober this morning and not have to be worrying about somebody seeing me laying up against a telephone pole, you know, with the dry heaps, or wondering where I was going to be able to put the bite on somebody for a couple of drinks. I didn't have to do either one of those things this morning. I felt wonderful. I even ate breakfast. You know, most of us spent a good many years in our lives when we drank breakfast. We didn't eat it. So that was uh, that was uh, wonderful, and I enjoyed it. And I thank God for it. I think uh, that when I went into the city hospital in Akron and was given this message, that that day I assumed a debt, a big debt, 
a debt of obligation, a moral debt, one that I would never get paid off, but one that I must always pay on. And that's the reason I came to Cleveland tonight. It was nice to be invited, but I still owe that debt. I hope that I will never forget that I do owe that debt. We all see many people who come into this program who forget. And I wonder if they go through life as happy as those of us who continue to pay in our little way on that debt. You know, it was just sort of like, of an, like an insurance policy that they handed me that day. I wanted to quit drinking. And I I have a life insurance policy that I pay on every year. And someday, you know, I'll die. And someone will collect. And probably the undertaker, somebody else will get the money. But I will have paid on it for a long time. But they gave me an insurance policy over there in Akron. An insurance policy of sobriety. Of a good way to live. A nice way to live. But they said, in order to keep this policy, you have to pay on it every day. But every day you can also collect on it. And I want to say that I've collected so much more than I've ever given. And I think all of us have, who have continued to enjoy this way of life. <clears throat> I grew up in Coshocton, and when I was a young man, another fellow and I went over to a little town in northwestern Ohio and went into the automobile business. <clears throat> now, it was a German community, and everybody there about at least all the people that I found, and you know we never find non-drinkers, either drank whiskey, made whiskey, or sold whiskey. And I got acquainted with all of them, believe you me. I never cared for someone to say to me, have a drink, and pour out a little drink put the cork back in the jug and set the jug back in the corn crib or wherever they had it hit. I'm talking about Prohibition days, all you old fellas drank Prohibition days. <clears throat> I wanted a couple or I wanted a three. I wanted enough to get a kick out of that. What was the use of the taste in your mouth? One drink. And you know, it took me a, a good many drinks and a good many drunks and a good many bad, sick days to realize that it wasn't that last drink I took that made me drunk. It was that first one. So after all, this wasn't such a, was such a battle. Of course, you just didn't stumble into meetings like this. I remember the first meeting they took me to in King's School, and you could have seated all the people in about one-fourth of this section. <clears throat> Not the first drink. It's not the last drink. It's the first drink. And I used to think in the morning when I wakened and I was so sick and nervous and fidgety and ready to fight. If I hadn't have taken those last two or three drinks last night, I wouldn't feel so tough this morning. I'm going to cut down a little today. But you know, I never either had brains enough. And I don't think it was brains. I think it was the desire for drink. I never had something that it took not to take that first drink the next morning because I thought I had to have it. And I did. We all did. And I will always be thankful that booze was cheap and plentiful in that community at that time. And you could always get a drink in the morning. And I've always been thankful that I didn't 
get on to something else to relieve those shakes. I had prospered, and then I had, as most drunks do, hit the bottom. Oh, I had gotten married. My wife was a nurse. She saw to it that there was something to eat in the house and so forth. And it didn't matter how drunk I got, I generally aimed to get home sometime before morning. Because, after all, I wasn't about to break that plate. You know, we're kind of sharp about a few things. Don't matter how drunk we are. I don't think my wife ever, at one time, ever really just took me right down the line and said, you've got to quit drinking. But she used to say some things in a rather pleasant way that made me know that it was bothering her pretty bad. Well, there was a young fellow in our town who who was a kind of a scallywag. He was a, a, a sort of a jack-of-all-trades and a master of none, and his father was a doctor there, and this kid had been kicked out of every college he'd ever gone to, and I would drink with him on occasion, but I'd rather drink with him if he had the bottle than if I had, because he was the kind, you know, if you'd give him a drink out of your bottle, he might steal it. He was really my sponsor. He never made this program. He died a ward of the probate court in the Toledo State Hospital. But I will always be grateful to him. And he, he called on me one night. His mother and my wife had made these arrangements. I had never heard of AA... I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I expect if he'd explained to me a little more fully, I wouldn't have been interested. But I knew I was drinking too much. And on a Saturday evening, there came a knock at the door, and my wife said, you go to the door. Uh, along about that time of day, I was always pretty mindful because I might have wanted to try to touch her for a dollar or... At least I wanted to get away from the house again. And, and you know, we never got through drinking. We drank as long as we could find anything. And Of course, we didn't like to go to the door too well because we never knew who might be there. Gentlemen back there, there's three chairs up here in front. I hate to see you stand up. And uh, I let him in. And he had a young lady with him. And I thought they'd come to make a social call. And I wasn't in any mood to have social callers because he was sober. And I didn't want to see anyone that was sober. But he came in and after the introductions and the small talk and so forth, I said, I'm glad you dropped in, Jimmy. You know, we're the biggest liars in the world. I want to give you a little drink. I didn't want to give that guy a drink, but I knew a few nights before I'd had the price of a pint. And I'd bought a full pint to have for morning. And when I went to get it the next morning, it was gone. Well, there wasn't anyone around the house but my wife and that tomcat. <laughs> and those tomcats are too smart to fool with that booze, you know. But we're always thinking, we're always finagling. And I thought right quick, this is the way to get the pint. I'll give Jimmy a drink and I'll get the pint. He was going to get a short one, I was going to get the pint. And I said to my wife, uh, where's that pint that I brought home the other night? Just as nonchalantly as if I'd have said, uh, did uh, you cut that cake I brought home, you know, hell, I never took a cake home in my life. And you know that sucker, what he said? Oh, I could have killed him. He said, no, thanks, John, don't get any for me. I'm not drinking today. 
Well, <laughs> I was, and I wanted that fight, but I never got it. A year after that, we moved back to Coshocton, and I was helping my wife unpack. And we were unpacking a barrel of stuff, and out she comes with that pint, and I said, my God, you would now. <clears throat> that time, I was honest. When I said to him in return, I would like to quit, Jim, but I can't. And my friends, I want to say right now, if you're not honest enough to admit to yourself, to God, and to another person that you want to quit, you better sit down and do a little thinking. Oh, I see so many people come into this program that never wants to admit that first step. They think it's terrible. I've got one on the griddle now, and I want to kill him every time I see him. You know what he told me? He said, well, I'll tell you how you can quit. He said there's a doctor over in Akron that has got a group of people together, and he said they're all drunks. And he said, they're all staying sober. And he said, I believe if you'd go over there and see them, it might help you. And I was interested. He said, you know, this guy will help you stop drinking. Now, he said, uh, he'll give you all the whiskey you want. Jeez, I hadn't heard that word for a long time. Of course, I didn't believe it exactly. You know, every one of us who's hit the bottom have lost faith in everyone, in ourselves, and in everything. And I had lost faith in all. And I didn't have much face in that statement. If that guy was going to show me how to quit drinking, what was he going to be giving me all the whiskey I wanted for? Because I never had had all the whiskey in my life that I wanted. And that sounds a little ridiculous to you non-alcoholics, but it's the truth. And I said, well, what would we have to do? He said, you should go into a hospital and get sobered up the first thing you do. And I said, if that guy gives me all the whiskey I want, I don't think I'll get sober. He said, well, it would be a good idea to try it. And I agreed to go to Akron with him. That boy's father was a wonderful man, a, a good country practitioner, honest and honorable. I had been drunk uh, 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 on various occasions, and I'd go up to his office in the morning. And he would give me a little Pepto-Bismol or something, you know, and charge you 75 cents for an office call. And uh, it, you know, the only difference is uh, it was just white when it came up. And I went up one morning, and I'd been drinking that old corn whiskey all night. And the doctor said to me, John, there's nothing that I've got in this room in the way of medicine that will ever do you any good. You've got to do this on your own. And I said, Doc, my God, I'm going to die if you don't give me something. And he reached up on the shelf and pulled down a quart, not a fifth. They didn't have fifths in those days, you know. A quart of bonded whiskey. And he poured a good big liberal drink out. And he said, John, this is the only thing that'll do you any good. I'm going to give you this. Don't come back anymore because I'm not going to give you any more. And my advice would be to you not to take any more after you take this drink. Good advice. Hell, I'd had that by the yard. And I took that drink and I thought if the good Lord ever made anything that tasted better than that, he kept it for himself. Bonded whiskey, you know, after drinking that old moonshine all night. You know what it done? It done something that that medicine he gave me, that Pepto-Bismol or whatever it was, never did for me. 
it straightened me right up, and when I left there, I paid him for another office call, 75 cents. And I thought, well, that's cheap, and I'm pretty feeling pretty good now, and I'll go on down. And I learned a lesson. I learned that that drink in the morning will bring you back quicker than anything else. And I never went back to the doctor's office again for any more medicine because there was a half a dozen bootleggers right around in the same block that we were doing business in, and I could get two or three big hypes like that of that old moonshine, you know, for less than 75 cents. He was the father of this young fellow that's taken me to Akron. And he poured me into city hospital, and I said, now be sure and keep that door closed because I didn't want anybody to know that there was a drunk in there. You know, oh, we're an egotistic. We're loaded down with false pride where we'd ought to be crawling, you know. We're trying to walk up on the heights. Maybe that doesn't apply to you, but it did to me. And this sponsor left. He said, I'm going to work in the morning, and tomorrow night there'll be a bunch of men come in to see you. And you know, there was something happened there. It's funny about how these things unravel when you ask for them to unravel. When you ask for good and, and, and you appreciate good and you accept good as it comes to you. There was a nurse come in in the morning and waking me up. And she said... What would you like for breakfast this morning? And I said, my God, girl, I want to drink a whiskey. She said, you can't have any whiskey in here. And I said, where's that guy that brought me in here last night? And she says, I don't know. But you know, that old thought struck me. That guy did lie to me. I said, where's that doctor that hands out this whiskey around you? Big deal, John, don't you know? Oh, yeah, we we were very important in this world, in our own minds, but wasn't it funny? We never realized how damned unimportant we were to the rest of the world. <clears throat> she said, are you Dr. Smith's patient? I said, I don't know what his name is, but I want to see him. I'm sick. And if I don't see him, I'm getting out of here. And she says, well, now, just don't talk about that, because... They always lock your clothes up when they bring you people in here. She said, you people, you know, kind of a little beneath my dignity, don't you know? They always lock your clothes up. She says it's 12 degrees below zero out there this morning, and there's about a foot of snow, and I wouldn't start out in those pajamas if I were you because it's a long way to the nearest bar. Oh, if ever there was a drunk got humble in a hurry, she humbled me. I started to talk nice to that young lady. She says, wait till I come back. And pretty soon she come back and she had a glass, you know, and a big hype in it. Big one. And I downed it. She said, whenever you want another one, reach up there on the bed and press that button and someone will bring it to you. Oh, I landed in heaven, you know. You know, everything that that monkey back there in Ottawa told me was coming true. I hadn't seen the doctor yet, but I didn't care a dang about seeing him because all I had to do to get that drink was press that button, and that beat scrounging for it, don't you know, Warren? You know. And then I got to thinking about that. And pretty after a while, she came back and she said, do you need another drink? And I said, well, I'd have another. Then I got to thinking, I told that monkey that I wanted to quit. And I knew you didn't quit when you kept on working on that old whiskey all day long. And I had four or five drinks that day. And that night, there was a knock came on that door, that door that was closed. And I said, come in, and I didn't know who was coming in that door or what was coming in that door. But I was afraid. 
But the door opened and five men come walking through that door. They were dressed up. They seemed to be happy. They seemed to be sober. And one of these fellows walked over to me. And a few of you fellows perhaps <laughs> that went to Akron at that time perhaps remember George Carson. Talked with a real gin husky voice. And ladies, you'll pardon the expression, but this is part of my story. And it is a great part of my life. He looked at me there in bed, had me shaved for three or four days. I was sick, I was nervous, I was scared. He looked down at me and said, Hello, you drunken son of a bitch. <laughs> and you know, that was the greatest thing that that guy could have said to me. Because for the first time in my life, I realized what I was. That's a kind of a tough pill to swallow. And I suppose if I'd have been up and going, I'd have probably have conked him with a beer bottle or something. But I swallowed it. There was a man who was a complete stranger. I had never seen him. I didn't know his name. I didn't know a thing about him in the world. But he knew a lot about me and didn't hesitate to tell me. Now, I don't advocate that procedure when you go out to make a 12-step call. But those men sat and talked to me till midnight, and I thought I'd go crazy listening to them. But you know, every one of those guys had been a worse boozer than I had. They'd been in jail, and they'd been in the workhouses, and, and poor old Sam there with that big scar around his uh, throat and up his arms where he'd tried to commit suicide. I'd thought about that, but as Ray Schaefer says, I was afraid it'd hurt. <laughs> well, here were these men, five complete strangers. One or two of those guys had walked clear across from downtown Akron through the snow and cold because he didn't have the price of a bus ticket over there. To see me, who was just exactly what George Carson had called me, and those men had come over there to help me. So you know what I mean when I say I owe a moral debt to this program that I will ever owe and will ever hope to try to pay on. And the next morning, a big, rough, raw bone Yankee come walking in there He had the longest, the boniest finger I ever saw on a man, and he pointed it at me, and he says, So you want to quit drinking, do you? And I said, Yeah. He said, My name's Bob Smith. I said, Are you the doctor? And he said, Yeah. He said, Did you have a drink today? And I said, No. He said, Wouldn't they give you any? And I said, Yeah. But I came to quit, and I thought maybe I'd better start this morning. And by the help of this program and the grace of God, I haven't taken a drink willfully since. He said, have you got any dough? I said, I got a little. It's right there on that table. He said, we got a book. Sells for three dollars and a half. Give me three dollars and a half. The next time I come out, I'll bring you one out. And while you're in, hosp in this hospital, read it. And if you get it read before you leave, read it again. Then he said, there's 12 steps in there. He said, read them about every 15 minutes or half an hour. He says, you've been drunk a long time, I understand. And I said, yeah. He said, your brain ain't in very good shape. You'll have to do a lot of reading to ever get it straightened out. But he said, I'm going to have him give you some medicine to kind of defog you a little. And they did. Every hour that I was in there, they gave me that belladonna. And am I upset in the apple oh, cart here? I'm sorry. It's a big book. <laughs> and he came back the next day and he started asking me about these 12 steps. 
I didn't know too much about him. He said, you better read him over a few times more and study him a little. Says that first step in there is pretty important to you. He says, are you ready to admit that you can't handle this booze? And I said, well, I think I am. He said, there ain't any thinking about it. You better know. The next day, he came back and walked in, and he wasn't carrying a book. He was carrying a, a manuscript. He said, I'm sorry we haven't we're out of these books and haven't got any, but I'll get one for you in two or three days. You know, they they didn't have enough money among the whole crowd of them to get more than a dozen or 15 of those books out of the warehouse at the time because they was in hock to this printer, and he wouldn't let them take them out unless they laid the dough down. So he handed me the manuscript. I think you've still got the manuscript one. And I read the manuscript. The proof sheets. But he brought me the book a couple of days later. But he was in every day. Say he could talk mean and ornery to you. And I think about these people that come into this program today that you carry around like you was wearing kid gloves and you might hurt them if you touched them too hard. And you say, I want to loan you this book, and I'd like to have you read it. And I'll bet you even though that there ain't one out of ten of them ever reads it, they'll tell you they did. If you want to know about this program, read that book. That's the best three and a half bucks I ever spent in my life. Because between the covers of that book is my life. I got a way of life from that book. They called it the big book, and they still call it the big book. It's a little bigger, it's a little bigger there than it was then. But they printed it on the very cheapest paper they could find, and they printed it in big type so us drunks could read it, don't you know? <laughs> they gave me a lot of things that week. There was a lot of people came to see me. I have always said that I was the luckiest guy ever come into this program because I happened to have been the only pigeon, as they call us at that time, that they had, uh, you know, that they could get to within their tentacles that week. So I think everyone in Akron came to see me that, that was practicing this program. And I made some wonderful friendships, wonderful acquaintances. A lot of those men are gone. <clears throat> but I'm thankful that I'm still here, still here to try to carry that message to someone who has not yet found it. They didn't take it, anything away from me, not anything, and they gave me so much. You know, they didn't even take a drink away from me. They gave me drinks. My bottle's about empty, but... And there's a little left in the bottom. Now, that was full when it was given to me a good many years ago. My wife put a lot of tape on it so it could never be opened, and it never has been. Now, if there's any doubt in any of your minds about me being an alcoholic, I want you to see that there's about a tablespoonful of gin still in that bottle. You know dang well I'm an alcoholic or I wouldn't have left that much in the bottle. You know, used to get up in the morning. You didn't have the price of a drink. You didn't know where you could find one. Maybe you'd had enough money a few days before to have bought a half a dozen bottles. I suppose you all done the same thing as I did. Just a few drops of water in each one of those bottles. Shake it a little. Wrench out all that was left and pour it all into one, and you had a, about a half a drink. There's still a little in the bottom of that one, and thank God I haven't had to pour it out yet for a drink in the morning. I will be ever grateful for that. I stayed around Akron for a month, and I went to meetings, and they wrote me in on a few 12-step calls, and I used to look at those poor devils. I was sober by that time and feeling pretty good, you know. I think, my God, I never was as bad as that. And after all, you can figure your plight the worst kind in this world, you know. And you can always look around and see someone else that's worse off than you are. 
And when you do that, why not say, thank you, God, for what you have given me? At least I didn't have it as rough as this other guy. I want to tell you about this monkey that I told you I'd been working with for the last three or four months. He came to see me first three or four years ago. I gave him a book, like we do, you know. I said, take it home and read it. That was the last book I had, and I had to have it a couple of three months later to take to another fella, and I had to go to his house, and his wife handed it to me and acted like I was a dog or something. And I've lived around that town a lot longer than she has, and she grew up there. I had no notion to stop and read her pedigree to her, and I thought, no, I guess that wouldn't be the proper thing for me to do. I'll just take the book and go on to see this next drunk. Last uh, November or December, this fellow came in, and, and he looked horrible, and I, I'd gotten word from where he worked what was going to be the result pretty quick, and he said, i, I got to talk to you. i got to do something. And I said, yeah, you look like it. I said, you only have to do one thing. You only have to quit drinking. Oh, well, he says, I, I, I know I do. And he never told me that a week or two later than that they fired him. Oh, he was probably a fellow making $15,000. Pretty good job in a small town. <clears throat> I have taken that guy to meetings... I, I have talked to him hour by hour by hour. And you know, he made me so damnable mad a couple of weeks ago. We had a fellow from Akron who led our meeting. Who uh, It was the Thursday night before Easter, and he led the most beautiful meeting I've ever led. And I say that with all due respect to a good many people in this room who I've heard lead time and time again. But this fellow led a beautiful meeting for that time of year or for any time. And in the course of his conversation, he made the remark that it made him a little nervous to stand up in front of a dais. Or maybe he said a dais. I don't know what he said. Didn't matter. And then this monkey come to me the next day and he said, you know, that guy told us that he had two or three college degrees. I said, yeah, he's a pretty smart man. He said, you know, he pronounced that word dias. I don't know whether it's dias or dias. He said he called it one when it should have been the other, and I said, you're wrong, and so was he. He said, well, what? He says, I went home and asked my wife, and he said, you know, my wife graduated from Vassar. I said, by God, they ought to taught her a few things over there. <laughs> well, he said, what do you mean? Well, I said, it wasn't either one. I said, that's a lectern. And that made him mad. <laughs> and I was glad it did. And I said to him, I want to tell you something. It don't matter what that man called that. He's so dang much smarter than you are that there's no comparison. And he said after I heard him misspell that word, I thought, well, that guy's a four-flusher. He hasn't got that kind of education. He says I just closed my mind and didn't listen to another word that he said. And I said, buddy, I'm going to tell you something. By God, you'd have better have listened because he would have given you a lot that you need. And he's been staying away from me ever since. And I don't care if he does. Anyone who thinks they're sick. You know, I still got a little of that old false pride I had when I was drunk. You know. Once in a while, some guy starts to step on my toes and tell me about how much smarter he is. And I have makes me mad. And when I get mad, I don't uh, have much science. I don't have much any time. But when I get mad, well, I tell him. And I tell him in no uncertain terms. Last October, Shafe was sitting over at my house one evening. We were visiting about something. And a telephone rang. And it was a fellow from a neighboring town. I'm going to give you this uh, other story as a comparison of how people react to this program. And the ones that appreciate it, how they do, and the ones who don't appreciate it, how they do. I've told you how the one that doesn't appreciate it has acted. And this fellow said, uh, are you John Ships? And I said, yeah. He said, are you the one that belongs to AA? I said, yep. He said, my name is so-and-so. I live in West Lafayette. I got 
in trouble, and I was told that if I talked to you, you could tell me something about AA. And I said, I'd be glad to. Would you like to come down? Oh, he said, I can't get down there. He said, I just got out of jail, and he took my driver's license. He says, I can't drive. Would you come up? I said, I can't come tonight, but I'll come tomorrow night. I said, uh, when did you have your last drink? Oh, he said, I haven't had a drink since two or three weeks ago. He'd been in jail. He couldn't get a drink. He didn't know the ropes. I went up the next night, and I talked to that fellow for a couple of hours, and he's home. He seemed very receptive. He had had a, a, a supervisory job in a factory there. And I said, what did they say over at the plant? He said, they didn't say anything. I didn't give him a chance to. He says, you know, I got arrested for drunken driving once before, and they told me if it ever happened again not to come back. And he says, I didn't go back. And I said, do you plan on going back? And he said, no. Uh, the president happens to be a pretty good friend of mine. And I said, I'll talk to Ed about this. I said, we had a fellow over there one time that came into the program, and, and they took him right back, and he was there until he retired. No, no, he said, don't bother doing that. He said, they told me if I ever got drunk and got in jail again not to come back, and I'm not going back. And I kind of admired the man for it, and yet at the same time, I thought it was kind of foolish. You know, most of these people we sponsor, you know, the first thing you do after you talk to them for 15 minutes and they go to one AA meeting, you know, they want you to get their wife back and their job back and their license back and their insurance back, and, and maybe they've lost a job and they want you to get them another job the next day. He wasn't that way. He said, what do I have to do? I said, stay sober today. I said, it wasn't the last drink you took that day before you got arrested. It was the first one. He said, yeah, that's right. He said, I hadn't thought about that. Well, I said, stay away from the first one. He said, that's right. He came to the meeting. Pardon me. He came to the meeting on Thursday night. He seemed to enjoy it. He didn't rush back there to the table and get his cookie and his coffee and gobble it down and run out the door. He stayed around. He wanted to visit. He wanted to learn. He wanted to be with people who knew how to stay sober. And as Mo Joder says, if you want to stay sober, stay with sober people. And I said to him one day, uh, have you tried to get a job yet? Well, he said, I've tried a few places, but I haven't got one. Well, I said, that's all right. There'll come a time. You have to prove to the world first that you can stay sober, that you're not the same guy that was picked up down there for drunken driving when you had that wreck. You've got to prove that to the world. There's nobody going to hire you when they know you're a drunk. And I said, you spend a little time proving to the world. And I said, everything will turn out all right for you. You know, I never had a man who ever seemed to believe everything I told him like he did. And he got acquainted with other fellas, and he got to go into other meetings. Never missed coming to our meeting. He was there every week. And he said to me a couple of weeks ago, now, John... You think I'm ready to take a job? And I say, yeah. Well, he said, I can't find one. I said, well, we'll find one. And we did. Little menial. Oh, it wasn't a managerial job. It was a job working out on the highway. It was work. He said, I don't care about the work. I'll do the work. But I've got to have something to do. I said, it won't pay as much money as you've been making by about one half or one third. He said, that's all right, but I've got to work. He was to go to work yesterday. Monday night, I got a telephone call from him. He said, could I talk to you right away? And I said, sure. I said, are you drinking? No, no, no. But I've got something I've got to talk to you about. And I said, well, I'm just going over to the office. I said, come on over and I'll talk to you over there. I went over and he said, you know, 
This was a political job I got him. He said, I got a call today from the Ford, uh, what kind of TVs the Ford Motor Company make? Ford Philco Company in Connersville, Indiana. They've built a new tube plant there. And they need a man who knows the enameling business and a salesman who sells them their grit or whatever they call it. Tell them about me. And he said they called me and wanted to know if I wanted the job. And he says, I've promised your friend to go to work for him tomorrow morning. I said, how much will they pay you? And he told me. And it was about four times what he'd make working for the county. He said, what'll I do? I said, you'll go take the job. That's in your line of work, and you want it, don't you? Oh, he said, I want it more than anything. I said, you know, I told you that whenever you learned how to stay sober and prove to the world that you could stay sober, that good things would happen. And I said, this is what you've been praying for, and your prayer's been answered. And I said, you take it. He says, what will that man think of me down there? I said, we'll take care of that man. I said, wait till I get him on the phone. And I called the man on the phone, and I told him the story. And I handed the, the, the telephone over to this fellow, and I said, you tell him. And he told him. And I never heard a man with more gratitude or more humility in his heart than that fellow had when he talked to that man. And the man said, I appreciate very much your calling. I had a place where I thought I could use you. I'm sorry I see you leave. But you go and take the other job because I know it'll be better than anything I'll ever have for you. And he said, if something doesn't work out that you get this job, you come back to me and I'll still have a job for you. And if ever you saw one happy man when he hung up that telephone, he was happy. <laughs> he left to take the job. I said, if I can do anything for you, tell me. He said, not a thing. I don't need a thing. Today, I got a telephone call. It was from the personnel man of that company. He said, are you John Ships? Yes. Uh, you're associated with AA? Yes. I didn't know who I was talking to. But for my book, uh, I'm an alcoholic, you can leave the anonymous, anonymous off because if there's anybody knows that I wasn't a damn drunk, it's because they never saw me. And I'm not ashamed for anybody to know that I'm sober today. And he told me who he was. And he said, uh, Mr. Moore has told me that you were his sponsor in AA. I said, that's right. He said, do you think we should hire him? I said, I'm not running your business, you are. He said, do you think he would stay sober if we did hire him? I said, I wouldn't guarantee it. But I said, if you want to bet a pretty good bundle of dough that he won't stay sober, I said, just get in touch with me and I'll just call whatever you want to bet that I can call. He says, you mean you'd bet on him? I said, yeah. But I said, I wouldn't even guarantee you that I'll be sober myself tomorrow, but I'm sober today. And I said, when that man left here, he was sober. And I'm not guaranteeing you that he's going to stay sober, but I'll bet money he will. And if you can use him, you put him in your plant, because I feel certain that that fellow will never cause you as much trouble as some of those drinkers that you've already got working for you. And I said, I never saw a man that worked for you, but I'll bet you you've got plenty of them. He said, I never had anybody talk to me like that before. And I said, well... I don't know what you, uh, what your attitude toward me or what I've said is, and I don't care. You've asked me a question, and I've answered it to the best of my ability. He said, we're going to keep him. We're going to put him to work. And he said, I want to thank you 
because I never had anyone explain this matter to me like you have. There's a difference in two people. One wanted to quit. He had an honest desire to quit drinking, to do something about it. The other guy still wants to drink, but he don't want to get drunk. He wants to drink, and he wants to have his job back. He wants to drink and have all these things that we cannot have when we are drinking. And he doesn't like to admit that he is an alcoholic. But he's told me about two ministers that he's had quite, uh, gotten quite a lot of good out of. And I said, that's dandy. What the hell are you bothering me for? I'm not a minister. You know, this program, is, uh, as Dr. Bob said, let's keep it simple. And when you stop to think about it, it is simple. I heard an illustration, maybe you've all heard it, but it's worth telling again, about the man who died, and he went to the next world, and he was greeted at the door, and the person who greeted him said, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? And he said, I don't know. I'd like to look them both over. <laughs> he said, which one do you want to see first? And he says, I want to take a look at hell. I've heard more about it. <laughs> he was probably an alcoholic and see more of it, too. <laughs> they took him down to hell, and it was just time for dinner. And he took him into a beautiful big banquet room. And there was all kind of wonderful food on the table. And everything was fine. But nobody seemed to be eating. And the people were sitting around there, and, and he noticed that all, every one of them had a great big long handled fork. But he also noticed that every one of them had his arms all bound up, and he couldn't bend them. And those people couldn't reach out there and get that food with their fork. Because the fork handle was long and their arm was stiff and they couldn't get it to their mouth. And the man said, this is hell. And he said, I don't think I want any of this. And he said, I'll show you heaven. And he showed him heaven. And it was the same situation. Here was this beautiful banquet room and the tables all beautifully set and plenty of fine food. And there were these people, and their arms all seemed to be stiff also. And they all had the long-handled forks. But he observed one thing. Those people had learned to feed each other. And they were getting along fine, and that was heaven. And that's all this program is, my friends. We have to learn to help each other. I copied there, cut this out of a newspaper the other day, a thought for the day. Mark Twain said, grief can take care of itself, but to get the full value of joy, you must have somebody to divide it with. And you know all of you who are alcoholics, and I don't know with the exception of, of a goodly number of the people that I have met here tonight that I've known over the years, Freddie Deets down there, and, and some of those boys, they come down to shock and fish, you know. They don't come down to fish, they come down to, to talk AA, you know, to Davy Jones. They have a lot of trouble with Davy, you know, and they have to come down there. He gets them down there because he tells them they can catch fish. Dr. Vett says, I'm the only honest fisherman on Wills Creek. He says, I tell you that I can't catch any fish out there. He says, I'm not going to lie about it. to find an honest fisherman something, you know. But I don't know how many of the rest of you are alcoholics. And it doesn't matter. I hope I haven't said anything and insulted any of you non-drinkers. But to you alcoholics, and I met a person here tonight who told me 
that they were celebrating three months of sobriety. That's a good record. But I was happy to be able to say to that person, those three months don't mean a damn thing. They don't mean anything. It was just today that counts. You know, at the beginning, I had an awful lot of trouble staying sober for one hour or one minute. <coughs> Pardon me. And if those people in Akron had told me that I was going to be sober 28 years from that day, I'd have said, I don't want anything to do with this program because I don't ever expect to live 28 years in the first place. In the second place, if I've got to live 28 years without a drink, I might as well die now. That was my feeling then. But they told me, just stay sober today and tomorrow it'd take care of itself. And after all, I can look around here and see a few of you people in here. This hair is about as thin and about as gray, and you're about as bald as I am. And I know when you reach that stage, you're not too young anymore, and you're just one heartbeat away from tomorrow. We all are. And if that old heart don't beat a time or two tonight, you know, tomorrow won't be here for us. So why worry about tomorrow? Stay sober today. Tomorrow, take care of yourself. I worry a lot about driving an automobile. I hate to drive up here, Dave. Not because I didn't like to drive up through the country, but I hated to drive in the city. I don't like driving in cities anymore. But you know, and I even had Ray Schaefer guide me, and I had the map that John McGinnis had made up for us just where to turn and everything. And Schaefer only missed two turns. <laughs> We've had a lot of fun, and we've driven a good many miles together. We never would have had that fun, and we never would have driven those miles together hadn't it been for this program. If ever there's a guy that gave of himself to this program, it's my friend Schaefer. I'm just a piker beside him. But he's happy, and he enjoys it, and we have a lot of fun. And we can all have a lot of fun. I used to think I was having fun when I was drinking. But when that drinking got serious, I didn't care about fun anymore. Then it was drinking. I wanted to drink. I used to know a fellow, he used to say, well, he'd talk about going fishing. Uh, I told you the other night, Johnny Mac. He said, why the trouble with going fishing with that guy? You get out there and the damn fool wants to fish. We didn't want to fish. We wanted to get drunk. I'm going to tell you one more story. Now, uh, I'm not running over my hour, but that preacher took a good bit of time. <laughs> uh, I was told when I was invited to lead one hour, and then we'd have an hour's friendship. And, of course, like all drunks, we got here two hours too early. We got here at 6.15 instead of 7.30. Your secretary told us to be here at 7.30. I'd been sober a while, and my father still lived in Coshocton. And he said, there's a business down here that I think probably you could do a little good with. And if you want to come down and look it over, why, you come down. He was pretty happy because I was sober. He wasn't a rich man, but he would saved a few nickels. And I went down, and it was a butcher shop. He said, now, these fellows are broke, but they're good butchers. And he said, uh, you and I will buy this stock and the equipment and so forth, and we'll take them in as partners. And uh, I had uh, fooled a good bit with the livestock business, and he said, you look after that end of it and handle the money. And he said, they'll cut the meat, and I believe you can do all right. And I finally said, okay. Well, these fellows had been broke, were broke. But we opened up again. They both drank whiskey. You knew one of them, Freddie. George, who lived here in Cleveland for a while. His liver finally blew up. The other one uh, is a ward of the probate court down in our town at my signing. He's over in the Cambridge State Hospital. And they drank whiskey every day. I'd been in the program. We opened in June. I'd been in since January. I had that to put up with. I had the old man to put up with. And I don't know which was the worst. 
We wasn't making any money, and I knew where the money was going. I drank too much whiskey and been around that money drawer too often to somebody else's. We'd been in there a year and a half or so, and a, a, an old man that used to loaf in the store a lot came in one morning, and he said, John, uh, it was in the fall, he said, John, my wife and I like sweet cider. And he said, I have a, a big jug that'll hold, I don't know, five gallon or something. And he said, I'd like to keep it sweet, and if I could put it in one of your refrigerators here, he says, I think it'd stay sweet. And he, he says, I'd bring a small container up when we want a little sweet cider, and to pour it out and take it home in the small jug. And he said, we'll have sweet cider all winter. And I said, fine, put it in that back cooler. Nobody will bother it back there. So one day he come waddling into the jug, and, and the boys helped him carry it in. And, and every so often he'd come up with a little bit of a decanter and fill it up and go trotting home with his sweet cider. And uh, spring came. And the old man came in one morning, and he came in every morning and sharpened his knife on one of the oil stones there in the cutting room. And uh, I don't know what he ever used that knife for, but he'd, he'd sharpen it every day and sharpened his knife and said, Well, John, I believe I'll take my jug home. It's empty. I said, Fine. And uh, he got his jug out of the cooler and shook it, and he said, well, there's, there's a good bit of cider in here yet, John. He said, this cider's just sweet as it was when I put it in there. He says, one folks said, did you try it? And I said, no, I didn't try it. He said, you get a glass, I want you to taste it. I got a glass, and he poured me a glass of cider. It was a warm spring morning, and I'd been working, and, it, and that cool cider tasted good. I drank it and walked up to the front of the store, and someone came in, and I talked to him in a few minutes, and I began to get that beautiful little tinkle. You know, you know if you've been sober for a few months, and then you take a drink, you know what that first, it really does something for you, you know, and I began to get it, that glow, that glow that we used to all think we could keep after we'd had a couple of drinks we thought if we took a couple of more and a couple of more, we could stay right on that glow, you know. It's funny how quick that light goes out. And you know what struck my mind? I'm going back and get another glass of that cider. Mark Love, John, you remember old Mark. And you've also heard the expression that we take the first drink that drink takes the next one, and those two take us. Well, I was getting taken. I thought I'll go back and get another drink of that cider. And I went back. And I said, where's Mark? And they said, we just loaded that damn jug of his in his car and sent him home. Well, I knew the one and brought the drink back there because he'd taken the jug. But I knew that just three or four doors up the street was Dobby's Saloon. Now, if any of you ever drank in Kashak and you drank in Dobby's Saloon, because he never pretended to run anything but a saloon, and he run a good one. I walked back up to the front of the store. This glow had begun to simmer off a little, you know, and I knew I was going to have to have something to bring it back, and I knew that a double header of gin would just set right with that cider. Now, I had been told in Akron to pray, and I didn't know how to pray. I thought nobody knew how to pray but these preachers. And I went out the front door and started up the street to Dobby's, and it was a nice spring morning. And I said, God, don't let me get drunk today. I knew what was going to happen. It was another chance for me in life, that business-wise. And I knew that if I got up there, I was going to get drunk. And I most sincerely ask God to keep me sober. 
You know, a friend of mine run a shoe store in the second door. I'm a Protestant. He was an Irish Catholic. And just as I got in front of his two shoe store, didn't hear come Tom walking out. Hi, John. Hi, Tom. I'm just going across the street for a cup of coffee. Come on, and I'll buy you one. Well, you know, we never turned down a drink of any kind that anybody ever offered to buy us. And I went across the street to a little coffee shop with Tom and had a cup of coffee instead of going on up to Dobby's and having that double shot of gin. And, you know, that night I thought about that. And I remembered what they told me over in Akron. You pray in your own way. And you pray to a God as you understand him. And for that, from that day to this, when I hear somebody say the spiritual part of this program, I like to interrupt them right then and there and say there is no spiritual part to this program. My friends, it's all spiritual. And without God's help working through this program, we won't stay sober. My prayer was answered. It came to, to me through, oh, Tom Garton and I had been friends all our lives. But it came to me from a God that I understood. And it came to me through a Catholic, and here I was, a dumb old Methodist. So it doesn't matter how it comes to you, my friend. If you're honest and sincere in this program, good things will happen, and they good things will come to you just as they're coming to that friend of mine down in Connersville, Indiana tonight, who's taking a nice job back in the business that he knows. I'll bet you money marbles or chalk that that other guy that wants to take this program with a grain of salt, his wife's probably giving him hell, and he's probably drunk. That's it. As a good doctor said, let's keep it simple. That's as simple as I know how to give it. I couldn't give it any other way because I'm simple. It's been wonderful to be here, to be a part of your 28th anniversary party. Uh, I may have a little trouble explaining to my wife why I'm coming home with a posy on. She may get to thinking maybe I got tied. I met some of my old lady friends here tonight in AA that I hadn't seen since Toronto. But we're coming up to Cleveland in a couple of months, three now, to the state conference. I hope to see you all then. I'll guarantee you I won't remember your names. But if I see you at an AA meeting, I'll feel that I've known you forever. It's been nice seeing all you people. Warren, I'm sorry you come back to Cuyahoga County to live. We was just getting you working good down there in Stark County and down in our section. But I want to wish you the best of luck in everything. And Johnny, the next time you have a birthday, for God's sake, don't tell me how old you are. It worries me. It's been nice. Thanks to you a lot. You've been a wonderful audience. And I hope that I've said somebody, something that's helped somebody. If I haven't, I can go home tonight and feel that I have made another payment on that moral debt that I owed AA. Thanks. Good job. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.